Hey everybody, welcome back to the studio today. I hope you are doing well. And uh, <clears throat> it's kind of like teaching a man to fish versus giving a man a blah, 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 you know that. Don't learn some of the same things that will benefit you more. <laughs> benefit more. Yeah, I don't like that either. <laughs> You're kind of up the creek without a paddle. You know that statement. So. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome back to the studio today. I hope you are doing well. If you haven't noticed already, I do have my gimbal out today, which is my camera gizmo that allows me to hold my camera at a distance in my hand and it not be all shaky. Just haven't used it in a while. I thought it'd be fun to uh, get this out today and play around with it. Uh, but we are also gonna talk about glazing today because several of you have asked about that. And uh, we will talk about some specifics of how I glaze. But more importantly, in my opinion, we're gonna talk about how I learned to glaze because that's, to me, kind of like that old adage about teaching a man how to fish versus giving a man a fish. And I think if I teach you how I learned to glaze and some of the thought process behind that, that will better serve you in the long run. And so, yeah, that's what we're covering today. And let's go. Well, here we are talking about glazing, as many of you have asked about. First thing I wanna show you is this stack of papers because this is just a small stack of papers that I found back in my glazing cabinet. And I have talked about these before on a, on a vlog about three years ago, maybe two years ago. Uh, but this was some, some mid-range glazes and some high temperature glazes that I've tested over the years. Some of them are amazing that I still use today, and a lot of them were just junk that didn't work on my clay or my glazes, or I didn't like the color, all those kind of things. But I thought I would show you guys this because this is part of how I learned to glaze. And uh, to, to some degree, learning to glaze is just trial and error, and you can't necessarily find a shortcut because you know, firing to whatever temperature you fire to with whatever glazes you have is going to be different from whatever I do. No matter if I give you the recipes that I use, they're probably going to look different in your kiln, at your temperature, your atmosphere, all those kind of things. Okay, so uh, that's partly why I think teaching you how I learned to glaze is more important because just giving you re the recipes that I use may not work in your kiln or at your temperature. And even if you fire to the same temperature I fired to, they may look different in your kiln. So, like I said, teaching you how I learned to glaze, I think, is more important. Uh, as far as firing to mid-range, which I have done in the past, I think probably one of the best things you could do right now if you're firing mid-range is probably buy commercial glazes because there are so many options. There's only a couple downsides. Number one, if you run out of that glaze and you don't have the recipe, you can't mix more even if you had the chemicals because you don't have the recipe. Or if the company you're buying that glaze from decides that, you know what, we're not gonna make that glaze anymore or they go out of business and you don't have the recipe, you're kind of up the creek without a paddle, you know that statement. So, <laughs> so I never really wanted to be in that position, plus I like mixing my glazes. Uh, to be honest with you though, I've never come up with a glaze from like from the bottom up Every glaze that I use, every glaze I've ever tested, other than some minor exceptions, every glaze I ever used, somebody, somebody either told me about or I did a Google search and found the glaze or I found it in a book. So everything that you need to know, there, you know, you could come up with the glazes from scratch. If you're a chemist and you understand all that, then that is amazing and that's awesome. I congratulate you for that, but that excludes 99% of us, okay? So if you're like me, and you don't know all that stuff and you don't want to take you know five years to learn it all then you know what there are hundreds and thousands of glaze recipes out there that you can just draw from and test and see what works and see what doesn't work so that's what i've done over the years i've just tested different glaze combinations and different layering techniques and so uh just to give you an example this is not going to give you any specifics on glaze recipes but if you can, uh, and actually this is probably going to be backwards because of my camera, but you can see different, uh, this, in this paper, there are, this was 35 different pots I had in one glaze load, and on each pot there were four different glazes, or, well, 
there were four different glaze combinations on each pot. So 35 times four, what is that? That's uh, 140 different glaze combinations I had in one load, okay? If I did that math right. I think I think I did that right. 30 times four is 120 and four times five is 20. So 140, okay. So 120 different glaze combinations in one load. Now that wasn't 35 or that wasn't 140 different glazes. Uh, what I learned, here's one of the best things I ever learned about glazing, is that you can take two glazes and if you put glaze one on first and then you put two, glaze two over top of it, it's gonna look one way. But if you put glaze number two on first and put glaze number one over it, it could look different. It may not look different, but it could and it probably will. And I've always liked playing around with runny glazes because glazes with movement always seem to look better than glazes that are just stationary. That's just the way pottery works, but you have to learn to control those runny glazes so that you don't ruin your pots and your shelves and, and all that kind of stuff. Because nobody wants to do that. It just makes a mess and then stuff's not able to sell or even to use. But what I did is, is this was mid-range glazes that I was testing here. I think I got every single one of these glazes here or the majority of them out of Mastering Cone 6 Glazes book, which is actually not in print anymore, but if you can find it, that's a great book for understanding Cone 6 Glazes and there's lots of recipes in there. But what I did is I took, uh, I, I made these sample pots and I would dip one glaze. I would, I, I had, I had uh, on, on each of these 35 pots, I had a main glaze and then I had two other glazes that I tested with it. Okay, so what I did is I would dip one side of the pot with the main glaze, let that dry, and then I would turn it halfway and I would dip one side with glaze two and another side with glaze three. So those would overlap over top of glaze one. Okay, and then I would turn it the other way after those two dry and I would dip glaze one over glaze two and three. And so then on one pot, I would have and over and under of three different glazes. So I had glaze one underneath, glaze two and three, and they would have glaze one over glaze two and three, and I would get four different glaze combinations on one pot. So that way I didn't have to do 140 different test tiles in a kiln to test all these glazes. I think most of these glazes I had tested by themselves in the kiln, so I knew they worked, but now I wanted to overlap them and see what kind of cool combinations I could get. And so that allowed me to test and get all these different glaze combinations that work. And then I think probably the highlights on this page are the ones that actually worked well together. And so that allowed me to test all these different combinations and see what worked and what didn't work. Uh, I thought I had one of those sample pots. I was gonna show you the shape because I would make these little cups with the little tray at the bottom attached. It was kind of like a planter with the tray bottom, uh, with the tray attached to the bottom, except the tray was small and there was no hole from the inside to the outside, all that. But I made these little cups with a tray so that if the glaze was really runny, it would catch that glaze in that little tray rather than running off on the shelf. So that's just one of the ways that I tested multiple, multiple different glazes on top of each other. Because if you've ever layered glazes, you've probably learned that glazes do like to run. And if they do run and you put two runny glazes on top of each other, they run even more. So uh, the way I was glazing those, I had that tray attached to the bottom so that I wouldn't ruin the shelves or the pots. And these were all just test pieces. And then I took those glaze combinations that looked well, and then I tried them on larger pieces. And I learned, like I said, uh, you know, I'll show you in a minute how I glaze some of my pieces. And, and sometimes... I guess the way I thought about glazes and the way I, I kind of, and I probably the way most people look at it, uh, I say that, but I'm not sure, but at least the way I approach glazes. A lot of times I always thought about, you know what, if you've got a solid color, you gotta put that glaze on first. And then if you're gonna do another glaze that's maybe runny that you don't put on the whole pot. My gimbal died. Okay, be back in a second. All right, so my gimbal died. So we may not be using that for the rest of the video, but uh, anyway, I, I probably didn't need to be using it because it was just stationary on the table, but I already had my camera mounted in it and all that jazz, so I was using it to record. But uh, at the, anyway, I thought I'd leave that in there because it was pretty funny when it died and it just, you know. Anyway, I don't even know what that looks like yet, but it'll be pretty funny. Uh, but either way, I got me my camera on a tripod now and we'll finish this thought and then we'll go to uh, another form of videoing and we'll, we'll actually glaze some pots together. Uh, but anyway, 
for, for me, most of the time that I thought about doing a solid color and then a more running glaze over top, I always thought about, well, yeah, you need to put the base coat on first and then put the running glaze over top. And that is actually not always true. Even one of the glazes I use today when I do that red and white and blue and all those, I've tested those two. Those are two different glazes that I put on. I've tested the, uh, the red on first and then the other glaze over top of it. And it doesn't do nearly the color and the change as if I put that other color just on the rim, like that much of the rim first, and then put the red over top of it. That's actually how I get all those colors that mix together. Craziest thing. Uh, also, I've learned that sometimes I have to put the, uh, the other way around. I do have to do it the way it made sense to me, but it, does, it just depends on the glaze combination. So, uh, so that's one thing that I would say is that if, if you've ever thought about that, that sometimes you have to put that base coat on first and then dip another color just on the rim over top of it, that's not always true and it's not always the way it works. So I just thought I'd share that with you because that's probably one of the biggest breakthroughs that I learned about layering glazes that sometimes putting glaze one over top of two is best and sometimes putting two over top of one is best, even if the one is the, the one number one may be the runny glaze and number two is the is the is the stable glaze if, if that's the way you're doing it that's just kind of the way i thought about glazes a lot of times sometimes you have to put the runny glaze underneath the stable glaze and sometimes you have to put it over and it will look differently and sometimes maybe you could just come up with both combinations look good and you get two different kind of glaze combinations out of out of the same two glazes and it looks different based on the way you layer them so layering is probably the best way that I've learned to change the way glazes look. And even if you have two glazes that everybody in the world uses, but they've never thought about layering them, you could layer them and get a whole different glaze. And everybody's like, man, you're amazing. How'd you do that? I just layered two glazes that everybody in the world already uses. And boom, you get a new color and a new glaze that everybody loves. And, uh, and, and you love it and people buy it if you're selling them and it works out great. So let's get to the next clip and we'll start glazing some pots. All right, here we are with some glazes already mixed up, as you just saw. And we're gonna be talking about, at least for the, just for the sake of this video, the glaze combination that makes up this uh, right here, which is my copper red and this mystery glaze here on top that, that honestly, if you did that glaze by itself, does not look good at all. Uh, but I believe it's, it's the combination, uh, I believe it has some uh, I can't remember the recipe, but I believe it has some lithium in it, and I believe it has some strontium in it, some different things that make it uh, a very interesting glaze, a very runny glaze when it's uh, mixed or, or layered with another glaze, but by itself, it's not a very pretty glaze at all. And um, I just happened to try layering that with multiple different glazes and found out that with this copper red, it makes it just go crazy and look all kinds of, of, of wild colors. As you guys have seen this picture, this, uh, this piece before, you can see that this is the plain copper red down here on the bottom. And then all of this, uh, this, this kind of drip here is where this glaze ran and like pushed the red down. And then I got this like halo here at the bottom. Uh, but that glaze there in the little bucket is what causes all of this. Everything from the cream to the blue to the black to this lighter, uh, red in there, all of that color all comes from the combination of those two being layered together. And like I mentioned earlier, I did uh, try this glaze combination both ways. I tried it with this on top of this and I tried it with this under this and I found out that this actually done underneath this worked better than the other way around. And it, like I said, for me, it was always funny to think about just deep, just deeping, just dipping the, the top or the rim of a piece in a glaze and then dipping the whole rest of the pot in another glaze just always seemed foreign or weird to me. Um, but I just found out by doing those tests that it did matter which one went on top. So we're just gonna glaze a couple pieces here in these two colors and I'll show you exactly how I do that. All right, we have a couple examples here of things that we are going to glaze. 
We have uh, one of these votive holders that I have for this uh, custom order. I've got a hundred of these and half of these need to be done in my red and blue combination, uh, but with the ash glaze on the bottom. So like this cup here was done uh, with these two layers of glaze and then uh, I didn't spray my ash glaze on the bottom. And then we're gonna do one of my social distancing mugs uh, because some of these, uh, I'm gonna do most of these either in a solid color. Uh, I'm pretty much gonna stay away from spraying the ash glaze on these if I can help it. Uh, number one, because that's a whole nother step. Uh, and because spraying the ash glaze when I have this medallion here that's already done with red iron, red iron oxide wash and with uh, the wax, if I spray the, gla the ash glaze on the bottom of these, the, red iron, uh, the uh, ash glaze will build up on this and then run down and make a mess. I've done that before. So I'm gonna try my best to do these uh, in solid colors or in combinations like this where I'll dip the top in this glaze here and then I'll dip the whole thing in the red. Um, and I'll show you the difference also of how I do that because I normally don't wax the bottom of my, my pots, but I did with these social distancing mugs, uh, mainly because I'm gonna be dipping these and I'll use dipping tongs to dip these and then the wax on the bottom will allow that to just clean off very easily. Most of the time, most of the pieces that I glaze, especially for my gas kiln, I will line the inside. I will, if I do the, a glaze combination like this, I'll dip this first, let that dry, and then I'll line the inside and then dip the outside a little bit more with, with this glaze as well. Uh, and, then, and then after that dries, I come back and spray my ash glaze on the bottom. Uh, we won't cover ash glazes today just because that's a whole nother setup and process. Uh, that maybe we'll cover ash glazes in a future video. Uh, but this is just about layering regular glazes and, uh, and, and you can do this with all, with all kinds of glazes and you could probably do this with ash glazes, but in my, my experience, the way I use ash glazes is mostly by spraying them on and I just have one or two ash glazes that I use anyways. And, uh, and those work out really well the way I use them. Uh, when I wood fire, a, a lot of pieces I will leave the part where I would have put ash glaze all the way down to the bottom. A lot of times if I use an ash glaze in my wood kiln, I'll spray it kind of like a transition glaze and it, it helps transition from the glaze I put on top and then allows some drips and then the bottom I leave raw because that in the wood kiln will get the salt glaze on the raw clay and I like that look. So um, that's what I do in my wood kiln. But here we're gonna dip uh, these couple in the first glaze here and we're doing those underneath the copper red uh, as, as opposed to being on top. Now every glaze you do like this is gonna be different, uh, but for me, I've, I've learned that this doesn't have to be very much of this, also depends on the thickness, but it doesn't have to be very much of this at all. Uh, and the other thing that I've learned recently is that if I want more of a varied look, like I did on this one, you can see where it kind of, uh, this, where, where it dripped down, this, this under glaze here that I put on this one dripped down. I actually put this on, instead of leaving it a straight line like that, I came back and added some more with a paintbrush or a dropper and to make that a little bit less of a straight line. And then I got more of this unevenness that I really like as far as the look of how that dripped down into the copper red below it. So for right now, I'm gonna leave that like this. Uh, this one I don't really need to add too much more to because I don't want that to drip too far because I, I still have to do the red and then I have to spray the ash glaze on the bottom. The social distancing mugs, I will probably dip these in the rim and then I'll also add a little bit more so I get more of that variation with these though. And come back with a paintbrush here and just because I know this this glaze interacts so much with the with the red and really about with just about any glaze that I put over it I don't necessarily have to worry about making this look good as far as the decoration uh, it's so runny and so interactive that I can just put it on here uh, and it doesn't have to be uh, it doesn't have to be smooth even lines some glazes will not interact well enough that you would have to kind of make them look more, uh, you know, you'd have to have the nice brush strokes and that kind of thing uh, to make them look well. But this one, you do not have to. So I'm just making that so it's an uneven line across there. And then when I dip this uh, copper red with that, then it will uh, hopefully come out looking like that base over there. Okay, normally I have set up and I'm doing a whole bunch of pots glazing at the same time. 
But for the sake of today's video, we're just doing a couple pots. Uh, and these have dried already just because it's, uh, you know, the, the, the bisquare dries them out. Um, they're not completely dry, but they're not, you know, and I'm, because I put so little of this other glaze on as well, it doesn't take long to dry. It's not fully on the inside and the outside, all those kind of things. So it doesn't take very long for all of this to, to dry to the point where we can put the second glaze on. Um, now, normally what I do if I'm doing, uh, if I'm going to do the ash glaze, like I said, what I'm going to do now is with the copper red, I'm going to pour it on the inside. Once I dump that out, I'm going to dip the outside and come down a little bit lower than this uh, bottom glaze. And that's going to give them room to interact and still get some of the red below where this where this glaze here is. And then this one here, I'm going to take my dipping tongs, which if you've never used these, if you're dipping a whole pot, uh, these are very nice to use for that uh, process because you can dip the whole thing in there, pick it up, dump out the excess glaze, and then set it down. Uh, I can wipe off the bottom with a sponge, any excess that's on, uh, even though I wax the bottom, and then I can set it down and I haven't, uh, you know, had to touch the pot while it's completely uh, uh, wet with the glaze. So uh, what I do for, for lining the inside is I just keep a, uh, uh, a measuring cup here and I'll pour it on the inside. And I like these measuring cups too because I can then mount them on the side. You guys know about lining the inside where you can just do that and spin it as it comes out. Then I'm gonna take that and dip it down in the outside like that. Copper reds, you have to dip those very thick to get them to turn out red. Um, so these are on there pretty thick. Uh, but there we go. We've got the, uh, the two layers of glaze there. And then I will take this and spray the ash glaze uh, down here on the bottom. And I'll spray it a little heavier right here where that bead of line is for the copper red. And that will give me those drips that you saw like on that cup over there. And now for the uh, social distancing mug. I uh, I did, like I said, I decided to do these differently than I normally do just because uh, I've already got so much time <laughs> into making the mugs, uh, doing the medallions, putting them on, and then I had to uh, iron oxide wash them, and then I had to wipe the excess off, and then I had to put the wax on the seal. I mean, it's just, it's, it's crazy how many different steps I've taken to make these, and I'm not really selling them for any more, that, uh, not, not much more than my regular mugs. Um, so I definitely was thinking, okay, I need to make this a little easier on myself. So I'm just going to do them in more solidish type colors. And so now that I've got this bottom glaze on and I've, I've altered that a little bit, oh, I should do on the, uh, a lot of times on the inside, I'll do that as well. I won't right now on this one, but I'll add a little extra on the inside as well. Like I did here on the outside. Um, but because I want to go ahead and glaze this one, I'm not going to do that with this one. With these tongs, the only thing is, is sometimes these, these little rubber handles slide off. Uh, so you have to be careful about that. But the good thing is, like I said, I can hold this cup like this with the tongs and these little points on the, on, on the ends of the tongs are not going to really affect it that much as far as uh, messing up the glaze. So I'm going to take that one off because it's sliding off really bad and I don't want to drop it while I'm holding it. So, um, but anyway, so what I can do is with this as I can go down then the glaze, dip it all the way in, make sure it's all the way around the inside and the outside, and then pick it back up like this and dump the excess out, uh, and then uh, wipe off the bottom and set it down on the table. All right, guys, well, there we go. This is a, a, an example of how I glaze, and I do different variations of this right here on most of my work. Um, like I said, apart from the ash glaze that I'll spray on this later, uh, but I also get, uh, like just like I normally glaze all of these same colors all in rows and batches of, of pots at a time, I'll also get all of my pots glazed with all the base colors first, and then when I go to spray glaze, I do that all at the same time, enough to fill up the whole load. Or if it's for the wood kiln, I might spray over a two-day two, day, two day period of time to get everything sprayed. But usually it doesn't take that long to spray everything, even for the wood kiln. Um, but uh, like I said, apart from the ash glaze that I spray on the pots, this is variations of this is what I do on pretty much all of my pottery. I love layering glazes. I love testing glazes. 
Uh, the only problem is sometimes when you've got orders and you've got things that you're getting ready for, it's hard to stop and mix the test glaze and put it on three or four pieces and layer it with different colors you already have. But the good thing is, is every time I mix a new glaze that I test that I think comes out well, I'll layer it with every other glaze that I have in a test and then that gives you just options, things that possibly could come out uh, as good combinations and a lot of times those fail but it only takes one really good combination like this and it's like man that was well worth all the testing and, and just being like hey let's just give it a shot and see what happens and you end up with a with a gem or a jewel every now and again and you know what if and, and that's the side where if, if you're buying commercial glazes and those are readily available you mix those two together and you know that combination and you're like man and if it starts selling if that's what you're doing with your pottery and you want to market it and sell it and it starts selling well, then you got a winner. Or if you mix it yourself and you got access to the raw materials, the chemicals, and you mix it, you know those glaze combinations and you know the recipes. As long as you don't mix them wrong when you're when you're mixing, that's the other downside of mixing your own. Is if you get distracted and you mess up a you mess up a a, a calculation, which I've done before, uh, then things don't turn out so well. But when you come across a gem like that, a combination that you're like, man, that really worked well, and I love that combination. Uh, then you're on to something and it's well worth it at that point. The victories are very sweet uh, and they help get rid of all those nasty, horrible experiences of glazes that just don't come out well. I will tell you this, I have learned that sometimes uh, it, it, it's not necessarily a bad glaze or a bad clay, but it could be a bad glaze and clay combination because there are just, just times where a glaze shrinks at a different rate than a clay shrinks and you just have a bad fit. And sometimes you just have to find a different clay. If you're really stuck on a certain glaze or you're really stuck on a certain clay, then you just have to find ones that work with the other. And, and I've had to do that myself. So anyway, hope this video helped you guys. I know I didn't go into detail about every single glaze that I used, but I wanted to go more conceptual and the ideas and how I learned how to glaze more than very specifics because this will help you no matter what kind of glazing you're doing. Uh, just the mindset behind it and layering glazes, I think, is key and uh, gives you a whole lot of world of options that you wouldn't have otherwise. So anyway, thank you guys as always for your support on the videos and the channel. Uh, feel free to like, share, subscribe, all those things before you go and uh, hit the thumbs up bell, uh, button and hit the bell so you're notified when I have new videos and live streams that I do. And uh, yeah, you guys are awesome and we'll see you soon. Thanks. Bye. Hey everybody, welcome back to the studio today. I hope you are doing well. Yeah, like that. You may not glaze like I do, and you may not fire like I do, but if I... D, 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 D. You may not fire like I do. Hello. Hey, uh, but also we're going to be talking about glazing and not necessarily... Yeah. I don't like that either. <laughs> Stop. Today we are going to talk about uh, yeah, ba ba ha ba hama hama, because I think if you learn how to glaze, then it's kind of like teaching a man to fish versus giving a man a you uh, know I think that is more important because it's. Hey Hey everybody, welcome back to the studio today. I hope you are doing well. And, uh, <clears throat> and if you didn't notice yet, we ha I have my gimbal out. We have, we have, hi, hi, hi. Hey everybody, welcome to the. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, uh, mm -hmm. we ha he ha ha ho. Hey everybody, welcome back to the studio today. I hope you are doing well. And today, if you didn't notice, we have my gimbal out. Why am I looking over there? No, look there. See, right there is the camera, not over here. All right, here we are. Uh, you guys. Uh, <clears throat>